Tech News Weekly is sponsored by Hover.com. Go to gfq.hover.com and get 10% off your entire purchase. FreshBooks. FreshBooks is an easy-to-use online invoicing service that saves you time, gets you paid faster, and makes you look professional. Get started completely for free at freshbooks.com. And by audible.com. Get a free audiobook by going to audiblepodcast.com slash gfq. Starting Tech News Weekly in 3, 2, 1... Welcome, everybody, to Tech News Weekly. I'm Andrew Zarian. Uh, Suncast is out this week, but in his place, uh, someone that you've seen uh, once before this week, Eric Lanigan's joining us. How you doing, Eric? I'm great, Andrew. Thanks for having me back. Second time this week. Yeah. Most of the time, people people just run away after the first week, but you, you've been sticking around. Exactly. I've been more than one place has you know, asked me back at the last minute because on, a, on a less than ideal circumstances, unfortunately, this week. Uh, Eric was uh, you did a unbelievable job on Twit for your show uh, Wednesday night after uh, finding out that Steve Jobs had passed. Uh, you did a marathon broadcast of about four hours. Thank you. Yeah, it was almost about five, like four and a half or so hours. Uh, once I think I hit record and going by that clock, and that was just standing up. So I just the whole time, I just, I just, I just kept going. I, the calls were coming in. People had a lot to say, so I just, I just let it go. And that's great that you decided, you know, you're going to keep doing it because it was a, it was an important moment for people to talk it, it, it was great I, I expected it would be very uh cathartic for people i expected that there would be a lot of things people wanted to say not only from watching uh you know round the clock coverage on multiple networks uh earlier in that day on wednesday but then also seeing the memorials and the things people were saying and leaving for steve around the world like at apple stores um you know special notes and things but uh so i knew there would be a lot of uh, uh desire to do that to to, to talk and, and share stories and memories about steve and what he meant to uh, you know, the average viewer. But what I really didn't expect was the amount of uh, brand new perspective that really came from from the callers that I hadn't heard from any commentator throughout the day. So that was really cool. I'm really glad uh, we could do that. And in fact, they uh, they demanded it be in reruns. So I think they've seen it now a few more times, too. Yeah, I was glad that it was in reruns because I didn't see uh, the beginning. And, uh, you know, Twit did an unbelievable job at the coverage. And I was sitting here when I guess I was on Twitter and I'm rarely on Twitter and I got and I saw that people are writing to Steve Jobs pass away. And, and I really I I almost didn't believe it because I've seen it before and we had it happen a couple times. And once AP put it out, I, I was deciding I was whether or not I'm going to flip the switch and go on the air. I couldn't do it. I couldn't get myself to do it. I didn't know what to say. Um, and there's so many other people doing the coverage and CNN was doing an unbelievable job with it. I decided not to. And it was very emotional. I mean, to, to think about what this guy had achieved, and regardless of where you stand on the Mac piece, uh, Mac Windows, uh, Apple Windows, uh, Apple Microsoft battle, uh, you have to respect the fact that this guy was an innovator, and we will not see someone like him for many, many years. A absolutely. From reading the stories about him and, and the, uh, the 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 uh, kind words that that everyone, I mean, every every company is is expressing their condolences and saying what an amazing visionary and genius he was, whatever you can say about his, uh, his, uh, his hot temper and personality, you know, uh, occasionally would fly off the handle and so forth. I think it's, uh, it, it was really touching that like every company that he ever dealt with, even, I mean, the most direct competitors came out and acknowledged the fact that, you know, after all the business is said and done, yeah. it, it, you don't want to see, you don't want to see, you don't want to win that way. You don't want to see the person, you know, die at such a young age when he still had so much left to give. Yeah, and considering the fact that Apple just had the keynote the day before, um, I you know that was something else. I, I don't. I I think that especially affected people because it was all about the iPhone, and we were talking about Apple, and I don't think anybody kind of expected it to happen this soon. After he exactly, left. it it was especially surreal for me because I had just been on. Uh, the, the Andy Dean show telling him how and basically slamming the the Apple announcement from Tuesday. This was uh, uh, Wednesday evening. And literally, like 10 minutes after that, I get a call back from them saying, can you come back on because Steve Jobs just died. And I had yeah. to do like an impromptu uh, you know, eulogy and say some thoughts, which was surreal because, I mean, I, at that point, I barely uh, knew that he actually was dead. Because like you said, there's been a lot of false rumors before, a lot of uh, false 
postings. Uh, so after I confirmed, I was like, oh my God. And so I just, you know, still kind of stunned. I just kind of said, <laughs> unfortunately, kind of the opposite, you know, praising Steve Jobs. Whereas before we were, I had just been saying how the iPhone 4S seems to be such a big disappointment. Did you, um, did you hear any negative feedback coming from people? I mean, I didn't see anybody in the media kind of uh, talking badly upon him. I, I did find something interesting. On Fox Business, they had the, the third co-founder of Apple. His name is slipping my mind now. The, uh, uh, the guy Mark from something? A, yeah, the guy from Atari that, that gave the initial $1,000. Oh, uh, so they had him on? What did he say? They had him on, and you know he's been very negative about Steve in the past, and I've seen some interviews he's done, and he said, you know, uh, Steve even ripped off Waz, and, and there have been stories about that. But he was very complimentary, and he was very... Um, just just praising Steve, which I found that interesting because this is a guy that, you know, bashed them numbers number of times in the past. Yeah. And I, I think what happens with with any historical figure that, that dies, uh, the 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 bad parts of their history sort of get expunged and we highlight and remember uh, the better moments. And I think reading some of the uh, memorials and tributes and obituaries written about Steve, it really puts it in a different perspective about how much he really did accomplish, how, how unique a person he was. I mean, if this were a case, like many people, this kind of hit them as, as similarly to the Michael Jackson uh, death in just a couple of years ago. Uh, and, and, you know, that was an example of people really fixated and focused on his best work in the 80s that he was known for and not the potential, you know, possible child molestation yeah. later in life. Yeah. And I think with Steve Jobs, I think a similar thing happened. People um, are really acknowledging the great work that he did in the early days of Apple, the creation of the first Mac, his comeback at Apple, how he turned the company around and uh, just all the great things he's done in that time and not focus as much on uh, the, the rougher edges of his personality. One thing that I've also noticed is that there were a lot of, um, I guess, false information about the, this. Not false information, but people just didn't know the real story about what happened with Apple and Steve. The fact that he was ousted in 1980 uh, is fascinating when he left Apple. Not quite 80 because he, he still had to do the Mac. I think it was about 85 or so. Uh, he, you know, what's interesting I was looking. The, oh, they, they initially were. Yeah, I'm looking here. Uh, they initially were not happy with him in 80. That's what right, I, right. I can here. imagine because that was. Yeah, because yeah, the Apple three and the Apple Lisa were really massive failures. One of the one of the only, you know, you can put on, on the short list with the uh, G4 Cube um, and, and the uh, iPod Hi-Fi that were one of Steve's notable failures because they were yeah. so big in public and the rest of his uh uh, the curriculum verite was so big. Yeah, he left in 1985, or e yes, 1985. Uh, yeah, but I, but it is it was a very fascinating thing because there was this five year span that you know there were people unhappy with the way things were going. Um, and it took five years to, to you know he left, and when he came back, it was a total different time and a totally different uh, Steve Jobs in the sense that he had all these things lined up for the company. The transition that Apple took, in my opinion, and the appealing thing about Apple, and I was talking to somebody about this, I don't think, to me especially, Apple was not an appealing thing until they went to Intel. And I never had a Mac before, so we were having this back and forth about, you know, what Apple was and, and how good it was really at that point. You know, let, let's talk about early 2000s. Um, and for me, it wasn't that that big of a deal until they went to Intel, and that that that's what was appealing to me. I, I kind of feel that the the Intel move really elevated the company's you know computer market, and that's my opinion. I mean, you've used a Mac, and this was a discussion I was having with someone. Do you think that that really gave them the boost that they wanted when they went to Intel, or if they never went to Intel, there would still be this buzz around it because of the iPhone and the iPad and everything else? I think they had to go to Intel. For performance reasons, uh, the, in the years leading up to their 2006 jump mm -hmm. to Intel, um, the PowerPC-based chips the, in the G5, um, it, it hit a roadblock. It couldn't, it couldn't get any faster. It couldn't scale. It couldn't get cheaper. And so they knew that in order to, you know, keep the company going, keep the Mac sales big, keep them, and keep the hardware itself competitive with uh, the PC Windows-based counterparts, they had to move to Intel. And I'm sure that 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 also um, really helped boost Apple's stature in the minds of. Uh, uh, business people using Macs in business where uh, the biggest excuse for trying a Mac now is that you can also load Windows. If you don't like yeah. the Mac, you can just install Windows on it. That becomes a regular old Windows PC, you know, no, no harm done. 
Uh, and I think that probably really helped Apple uh, move into business where they now are, are popular and growing. Yeah, I, to me, it was, it was a big deal. And that, that, that was my first Mac. I never had a, a Mac before they went to Intel. So it's kind of hard for me to, to get into the whole Mac PC battle because to me, it's, it's always been good. Because I've had, I came on board, you know, in 2007. I've I've never experienced the issues that a lot of people, you know, dislike Apple for, and a lot of the uh, the cutoffs when they discontinued certain things that that a lot of hardcore users weren't happy with. But that leads me to something else. You know, that was a big jump for Apple to do when they went from uh, the Power PC to Intel. I mean, that was a, I guess it was unexpected to some people, but expected to many. Uh, it's their, it's a transition. It's the growth of the of the device. We've seen the iPhone come out. We've seen the iPad come out. Uh, and every year, we're kind of used to this big leap. Uh, we're used to this grand uh, premiere of a device, but we didn't really get that. And, and you did the coverage with me for the iPhone launch. We didn't really get that with this iPhone. I do want to say I just ordered a, uh, a 4S for my wife, so uh, and it's going to be our first iPhone. But to many people, this was not the big bang device they were expecting to see. I don't know if it'll affect them in any way with their sales. I don't know if a lot of people are going to be turned off to it. I doubt it. But with the with the news coming out that Steve Jobs, you know, uh, passed away, do you think this might have been a strategic move by Apple to kind of hold off on releasing the iPhone 5? Maybe wait. You know, I've heard a couple of people say that. Um, I, I can't really imagine why or i can't imagine how they would they would just be holding off on on a, on a worldwide shipment of something that they otherwise would have had ready to go you know it kind of seems like too big of a thing uh just to be able to postpone silently with no one knowing yeah. and then somehow also have another another product there i mean what what were they, were they going to have a 4s and a 5 and then like a week before they changed it to just a 4s or did they just invent the 4s within a week and, I, and I manufactured had, it I, that seems unlikely to me i had some information come to me from uh, an apple employee Ooh. Um, and they had told me that there was definitely a four S, and there is a there is a five, but they experienced some issues with the five, and they scratched it about a month and a half ago. And they're holding off, and we and this is before the launch happened. And I and I said no, we'll probably have a five. I didn't even expect a four S. He goes, no, it's going to be a four S. There's going to be no five yet, and we're going to expect the five probably around March. Because they're developing for LTE, they want an LTE device. I'm looking at my notes, and uh, they're reporting that the next, the five will be an LTE device. So it, it's interesting how you know that whatever this guy has said to me uh, has happened. Yeah, I'm sure that the the, the five will be a 4G device because they're a little bit they're they're a little bit late to the party on that with other manufacturers and, and a lot of the Android smartphones. But um, what I've read is that people who 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 dug into the Qualcomm product line and looked at the, 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 the I think they're one of the only manufacturers of uh, 4G LTE uh, baseband components and, and chips and looked at that and said that they, just by their product roadmap of not being able to have um, for sale to people like Apple, a baseband chip for that can do LTE and voice, yeah. voice and data, because LTE by itself doesn't really do voice. Um, or something. I think I have that right. But yeah. the roadmap shows that chip not being available even to Apple until um, about quarter two of 2012, which would put it that maybe Q3 2012 yeah. as, as the earliest uh, possible LTE iPhone 5. Did your source mention anything about the baseband availability of the chips? No, he, he it, it was a very, you know what it was? It was a very brief conversation I had with them. And I get this a lot. I get a lot of people saying like, oh, yeah, I work at Apple. And he didn't want to really disclose what he does, but he said he works. And he's not like a retailer. He doesn't work in a shop. Like he works at Apple. And uh, it was a very fast conversation. I really didn't take it serious. Maybe I should have uh, because I get it a lot. I get a lot of people tell me oh, I work here, I work there. And then there's really no information. So I would love to talk to him again. And I'm, I'm sure I will see him again uh, within the next couple of weeks. So I'll probably ask him a couple more questions about this. And hopefully maybe I could do something with like, you know, where they uh, distort the voice and they have like the black thing. Maybe I could get him <laughs> in and do that because he doesn't want to really disclose who he is. Uh, oh, absolutely. You'll definitely yeah, get you got to be careful with that because you get, get the guy fired easily. Yeah. Uh, so um, I, I don't want to really dwell on the Steve Jobs thing uh, this much. Uh, you did a great coverage. Many people did great coverage of this. Uh, we did coverage of the iPhone. Uh, I think we said everything that we could have possibly said about the iPhone. Uh, I just have one other thought I'd like to say about Steve Jobs yeah. because I, I was watching part uh, yesterday of, the, of a video that as I was watching it, I think I never had seen before. 
Um, I had seen the clip of him talk. Did you happen to see on YouTube a while back uh, the, the clip of Steve Jobs in 1997 before he was even the CEO? It was after it was after Gil Emilio bought Next, but yeah. still had Steve as an advisor to him as CEO. Um, and he's on stage and he's answering just totally off the cuff, unscripted Q and A for uh, over an hour. And the guy starts attacking him, like in the crowd. Yeah, yeah. Well, I saw yeah. That. So on YouTube, there's two popular clips of that. There's the there's the uh, the the insult guy who really goes after him, and then there's also the one where it says Steve Jobs uh, uh, predicts iCloud in 1997. Well, I found another one where actually predicts the iPhone pretty clearly as well, which is really cool. But the other clip that I wish I could have uh, uh, pulled out for you and played here was where he says that. He just very uh, clearly and, and uh, passionately describes how he says something like, I've never seen a product that was great, a great product that wasn't designed by people who designed it to be the best product that they could make, to be the kind of product that they themselves want to use mm -hmm. and to have their friends and family using. And I think whatever else you can say about Steve, that is something that he did that, that in his life that is unique. He rarely ever made a product that he didn't believe in, maybe never. Whereas if you think about how most CEOs have to get up on stage and talk about their, uh, their, their, their low end, low end of the markets, super cheap phones or something, whatever they're making they, you know, every company has their crap line that the CEO himself would never use. But Steve never made a product like that. He's it was worth $6 billion or more. And yet everything he made for the average consumer were things that he himself wanted to use that he could be proud to give to his friends and family and anyone else uh, who could afford to buy anything in the world. Mm -hmm. And I think that is uh, uh, pretty unique about him and something yeah. that more people should emulate. Uh, it, it, I like the fact that he grabs the chair as as the guy's attacking him and he starts pushing yeah. the chair out. I thought that was very interesting that he did that because that's not the Steve yeah. that you've seen the last couple of years. You know, he's uh, ever since he got sick, it's been a different Steve you got him. But it was good to see uh, all these remembrance uh, pieces that they've compiled. I think Gizmodo did a great piece with him. Uh, I think it was Boing Boing that went to like the eight bit type uh, environment, right? Yeah, On they the did website. the they they reskinned their page right after the uh, the, the the death announcement um, to 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 look like the old nineteen eighty four Mac yeah. desktop. So uh, you know, Steve which is Jobs. actually now available as a WordPress uh, template that, that anyone could download. I saw. Oh, that's interesting. Uh, that's actually I would love to get the link. I'll put in the uh, the notes. Oh sure. Uh, so Steve Jobs passes away, fifty six years old, uh, October fifth, twenty eleven. Uh, Tim Cook, you know, now is, is the guy, you know, Steve Jobs had, had stepped down, but he was still the, the face of the company. And I think he'll always be the face of the company. Uh, the worst thing that could possibly happen to Apple is if the Steve Jobs persona becomes this, this, I don't want to say in a weird way, like a higher power for Apple and will always be connected to Apple. I mean, it always will be, but in the sense like of, of worship of sorts, when employees are working at Apple and they want to work like Steve Jobs and they want to have things created like Steve Jobs because that never works either. Steve was great at creating a team uh, with, with brilliant minds to create these devices. I think Steve was a great uh, manager of sorts, but he was not the creator of these devices. Uh, I think you're right. There is a there's a risk of doing that. There's a, there's a big risk of, of shaping the company and shaping every employee to as like thinking, Steve. what would Steve do? Yeah. And in fact, they actually have been doing that and are doing that. They have codified it. They've made it into a university style uh, lecture and, and teachable series. The LA Times published a really fascinating article yesterday about how in 2008, Steve Jobs, uh, knowing that, that uh, his time may have been short, um, hired away the dean of Yale Business School who, who was like a very uh, innovative dean who turned that school around and uh, and had him study Steve and study Apple's business practices and come up with a curriculum wow. that they call Apple University internally that is now taught to uh, Apple employees and Apple executives to, to think like Apple, which is really to say to think like Steve. Think like Steve, um, yeah. And, and so I think that, that there absolutely is that danger, and I don't – I. I, I don't know how they will ever actually outrun that and whether they will actually even be successful once all of uh, Steve's ideas are um, made in the products. And then, you know, where will we be five years from now? I'm not sure. Oh, and it's going to be interesting to see where what Apple shapes into. Uh, the worst thing that could happen is if they have these, you know, interim CEOs, if, if something happens and Tim Cook is gone. Uh, and I think Tim Cook is the best person to fill in Steve's shoes. Um, he has and that. 
And they've locked him in because they gave him yeah. the biggest compensation uh, that, that vests, I think, in 2016 or so. So they want to keep him for a very they long do. time. I think one after that. So, And I read that it was actually the biggest uh, compensation of any company, or maybe just Apple, uh, since Steve Jobs in 2000 got, a, got his bonus for turning around the company to profitability. So it's uh, they really want him to stick around. Yeah, the worst thing could happen is if, if Tim leaves for whatever, who knows what reason, they get these interim CEOs uh, to run the company. I mean, that, that's the worst thing that could happen to any company. Uh, you see what's happening to HP and Yahoo and with these big moves. But uh, I do want to go to another subject with this, and it, and it is Apple-related. Uh, Samsung and Google were going to have this big unveiling uh, next week. And they have canned it. They have delayed the event. Did they say what day they delayed the event till? Yes, I'm pretty sure it's October 27th now. Okay. It's probably going to be in London, and it's going to actually coincide with Nokia's big uh, press event. And, and Nokia's, I was imagining it would be the Windows uh, phone stuff. Yeah, it probably will be. It probably yeah. will be uh, Nokia's Windows Phone 7 uh, hardware. Which, which if, if it looks anything like the N9, uh, it's going to be a phenomenal device. I'm just curious to see why they moved it. Now, there's different reasons why they said they moved it. We were speculating before the show... Uh, my my theory is that they probably had a couple jabs with Apple in there and maybe attacking them uh, on a grander scale than we would expect them to do. And they decided, well, you know what, let's pull this. Let's think about what we're going to say now and not go after Apple as much because Steve passed away. I bet they absolutely had some jabs because when Google announced, um, when they first talked about Ice Cream Sandwich at, I guess it was Google I.O. back in May, um, they had m multiple slides that showed, I think there was there was an Android, the little Android mascot eating an apple at one point. Um, and there were some other ones. And that was not the first time they've done that. And they and they they did make a couple of jabs to Apple on stage yeah. um, and in their slides. <laughs> so, I mean, publicly and, and very explicitly jabbing at Apple and uh, Amazon. After it was announced that Steve died, they pulled their letter, they put Jeff Bezos's letter that was on the Amazon homepage since the announcement of the Kindle Fire that started with the phrase, I, I'm paraphrasing, it was like, um, uh, there are two types of companies, ones that try to charge their customers more and those that try to charge their customers less. It was, it was very, are, simple, very close to that, actually. I remember reading that. Yeah. And, and when I saw that the first time, I thought, well, that's, a, that's meant to be a jab at Apple, keeping their prices high. And I suspect that's the reason that they uh, pulled the note, but, but kept the Kindle uh, line up a, on the homepage. Uh, yeah, I, I think they're going. A lot of these companies are going to start thinking differently and, and approaching the next couple of weeks in a different way. Now, this is this is the fast. Now, to speculate on the Samsung announcement, I was expecting it to be the Nexus, uh, the Samsung Nex Galaxy Nexus or Nexus Prime, whatever they were going. Nexus Prime, yeah. Depending on because I also saw it called the Galaxy uh, Nexus. I don't know how they're going to do this. I guess depending on what carrier you're on, it might carry a different name. Uh, I, I had initially heard that it was a Verizon exclusive device, but I don't know if that's uh, true right now. I heard that. I heard that too. I heard it was going to be an LTE Verizon phone, but called the, the Nex called the uh, Samsung Nexus Prime. Yeah, is what I heard, and that would it would be running ice cream sandwich. And then I see Galaxy Nexus here. So who knows? Uh, we don't know. The naming is not the most important thing, but. What was interesting to me is that the rumors are out that it's going to be be a big device, possibly almost a five inch phone. Yeah, I, who's that appealing by, to? Twelve eighty by seven twenty resolution. That's a big uh, phone. I yeah, mean, yeah, it's it's kind of weird, right? Because the point was that Ice Cream Sandwich is the first version of Android to bridge the gap between the phone version, which uh, officially closed out with version 2, and the tablet-only version, which officially closed out with version 3. Yeah. And so it's supposed to combine the tablet and the phone experiences, and I guess they took that a little bit too literally and decided to make a phone that literally is but sits between, size-wise, a phone and a tablet. Yeah. Do you think this is a smart move to have your first unveiling of your Ice Cream Sandwich phone uh Possibly a, a massive iPhone competitor. You know, it, it's my feeling has always been, and I and I get a lot of criticism over it. I don't feel that Android is at the level of iOS. Uh, it's due to multiple things. I know there are many things that Android does. I think Android does a little better of a job with email clients. Uh, but overall, the overall operating system, I always say iOS is far superior than everything else. Uh, that's why I'm trying to get my hands on a Windows phone because I haven't used one. But as far as I know. I don't think this is a good move to release this five-inch phone 
uh, to, to be this competitor with the iPhone that's out on the market, you're alienating a very large portion of your, your customers that do not want a 5-inch phone. And, and I don't understand that whole mindset of releasing this 5-inch phone, if it is a 5-inch phone. And from what I've seen, it has this curved back, and it's, you know, they keep saying, like, bigger is better, and, and that I guess it's going to be a big screen. Do you feel that that's, that's a great way of competing? I mean, releasing this very niche device as your first pro- premier uh, premium ice cream sandwich Google phone. I think you said it exactly right. It's a very niche device. The five-inch uh, phone tablet hybrid has never been popular from any company yet. I think the most famous failure was the Dell Streak. Um, they they, they oh, killed yeah. that very quickly. There just haven't been... Uh, to use the Steve Jobs phrase, it's a, they're they're tweeners. They're they're between a phone and the tablet, and it's kind of a a little bit of a no man's land. Um, some speculation I've heard is that the reason that a lot of these 4G LTE phones are coming out with extra big screens and extra extra big physical size is because LTE requires so much more power uh, in the current generation uh-huh. of chips that, that they have to build yeah. in larger batteries to achieve the same battery life. And maybe that's why the phones are already, uh, you know, they know they need more surface area, so they go ahead and just make the screen bigger. Yeah, I was about to say, you know, right before you said that, I was about to say, if you've noticed, every one of these Android phones coming out, these, these you know, high-end Android phones, they're all 4.5, 4. You know, they're big screens. They're very big screens. And to me, it's not appealing. And I want an Android phone with a normal size screen, Uh I, I guess, you know, what would be a good size? I, what's the, uh, the the Galaxy S? How big is it? 4.3? Or a little bigger? Oh, offhand, I have no idea. I don't think it's, I don't think it's much different from uh, the iPhone screen. Uh, let's see. Screen size. Uh, Galaxy S screen size. I'm, I'm not too sure what the screen size is, but it seems like it's, it's a decent size screen. When it, it's, it's phone size. I think it's we, phone we, we size. Okay. It's, it's not trying to be anything but a phone. Let's put it that way. But you're releasing a five-inch phone. I mean, that's that's obscenely big. It is very big. It's very big. And, and I hope and, it's and I not think the market true. has decided that it's too big. And I think maybe they're trying to do it in order to capitalize on the 4G. Maybe Again, maybe it's a technical requirement. They need bigger battery. They need a physically larger device for the LTE capability. Or maybe they just want to capitalize on the faster web browsing by encouraging more web browsing on the device. I don't know. Yeah, unfortunately, the Android experience is not that positive with web browsing. That's 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 a problem when it's not an easy thing to do. Uh, ice cream sandwich hopefully will be um, bridging the gap between uh, all the buggy stuff in i in in Android and in with iOS. And I do feel that they've come a long way. I was just talking to somebody today about it and how what it's like for Android from the time that they I got my first Android about two years ago when I got the Droid and what it, what it's at now. And I think there have been improvements, but we have not seen major improvements. And I think that's holding the device back. You know, I think. Oh, go ahead. No, go ahead. Uh, one of the biggest improvements uh, that I can think of that could even possibly that you could have for a tablet is that new Amazon Kindle Fire uh, Silk browser. Yeah. Where uh, where all the browsing is done on their end, and they're actually pushing the web pages to your device, caching them in the future while you're still reading the article that got to that one page before you even know that you want to click back to the home page or to the business section or whatever you're reading. Uh, they'll push the the page to your device and do all the browsing on their um, their massive EC2 servers that are connected to the back end of the internet. But uh, it's kind of internet backbone. But it's kind of like what what Opera Mini does, right? Opera Mini's been doing that. It's a little, yeah, it's a little bit better because it, it converts more than Opera Mini. It converts uh, non-native, non-device native JavaScript code to uh, ARM machine code, so it runs faster and uh, more efficiently on the battery. It probably also converts Flash I- in real time uh, to your device. It's, uh, you know, Safari, I think mobile Safari does it. Desktop Safari does as for a long time, and I believe Chrome does too. They do this uh, DNS prefetching which is that when you're looking on a page and you're just reading a web page, meaning just reading, not clicking on something, uh, it's going and pre-looking up and pre-caching the DNS and matching up the IP addresses of all the links that are displayed on the page just in case you want to click on them and it'll uh, make your experience that much faster. Well, in Amazon's case, they know more than that. They're not just doing the DNS lookups and caching them on their own server, meaning it doesn't even have to go round trip to your device. It's on their server and all the outside requests are done from their server back to the world. But it's mostly in their cache. You mostly never leave their local servers because a lot of the web pages are stored there and everyone's browsing goes through there. So it's all cached if it's a popular thing. And the biggest change, again, is that it all goes 
uh, to your device pre-caches before you even know you want to click on the link, just from statistical averages of what people are most likely to click on next on a certain page based on aggregate uh, browsing statistics and, and habits uh, throughout the day. So I think Google, I think that would give Google a big run for their money, but I wonder what would happen because if Google did feel that they need to uh, emulate Amazon on that feature in order to compete with a faster mobile browsing experience, and then maybe Apple would feel that they have to compete with them, and then someone else with them, probably Microsoft, mm -hmm. um, at what point, probably at the Google point, would the Department of Justice or someone step in and say, we already don't like what you're doing with privacy, now you're being... Uh, monopolistic and, and uh, even worse, funneling everyone's traffic through your own servers. I'm surprised Amazon was able to get away with that uh, in terms of just PR and publicity, that no one went after them the way that we go after Facebook, Google, Apple, and Microsoft. But I think if any of those people tried to do it, which they would have to, if this is as successful as Amazon says it will be and faster as they say it will be, then I think this could really blow up into a, either, a ma either a massive change in the way all web browsers work or... Um, Amazon might have some kind of runaway success because uh, yeah. the other companies legally can't do that. I well, don't know. Well, he, what are the security uh, issues with this? I mean, I know many people have been talking about, well, are they going to know what I'm doing? How are they going to do this? How encrypted is it? Uh, is everything I'm doing and everything I'm typing, everything I'm looking up going to be stored on some server? Uh, so already a lot of people are concerned over this. Uh, have they stated on how they're going to do encryption when it comes to your, your searches? I'm curious well, I think the I think we know no they haven't been they haven't been terribly specific. They did mention that they're going to be the man in the middle uh, with the SSL certificates, and they didn't go into right. details. And I don't know enough to speculate on the details of how this works. But there is something about your your connection to Amazon servers is encrypted and constantly connected, constantly running and open as a TCP connection. And then they go and they their quote is on your behalf. They will make the SSL connection to the external server on your behalf so do they and can they see in clear text everything that you're viewing like your passwords or your bank statements or something like that do they actually decrypt it there or do they just pass it along to you i don't think we know that for sure yet uh, what what i'm also surprised about the kindle is that we have not seen any they have not allowed the press to have hands on with this device uh, right and, and i found that very interesting i found that weird in a way where they're not really looking at the media and saying okay i want you guys to review this device i want you guys to talk about it we really don't know what the interface is is really like uh for real-time use uh we really don't know much about the browser i mean there's a lot of stuff that we don't know about this i, I pre-ordered it i i should be getting it you know you the release day yeah uh i actually got it for my wife for her birthday but i decided that i'm going to take that and i'm going to give her the iphone so i'm going to keep it for myself I'm, I'm, I thought I thought about getting one, but I I I I think uh, I'm inclined to believe the rumors that there is going to be a uh, a better, faster one. I do yeah. sometime in the next quarter or two of next year. No, I I, I do think they're going to release a 10 inch one. It was a total impulse buy, and it just shows you for 199 dollars, you could kind of justify an impulse buy like that. And I think exactly. many people they they claim that almost 100 thousand people pre ordered the device within the first 24 hours, and. I really think many of those purchases are impulse buys due to the low pricing structure that they've created for the Kindle. Exactly. I, the number I saw as of Wednesday was 250,000 pre-orders. Already. Now, I, Already. Yeah. I mean, oh, wow, that, that's great. I mean, that's a yeah. big seller. It's, it's going to be huge. I mean, I think this, I, I don't, frankly, I don't know how any other non-iPad tablet maker can possibly compete with that price. I, I really, so, they've never come close yet. No, and I've, and I've said this for a couple of weeks now. I really hope this encourages these uh, manufacturers, uh, Sony and whoever's making a tablet, encourages them to, to realize and almost wakes them up and says a $600 tablet is not realistic for anybody and nobody's going to buy it at this rate. So why don't we cut some corners here and make a cheaper device and sell it for $199, $150? I think this is this is going to change the industry, and you know they they discuss that the iPhone, uh, the iPad changed the tablet industry. The iPad is not a tablet. The iPad is an iPad, in my opinion. It's not competing with any of them. I think what will change the the tablet market is this single device due to the pricing structure. I think a lot of people are going to say, you know what, maybe we should have a cheaper device. It, it's in the a way you it's phrased it. I, I don't think they. I don't. I don't really think that there is room for the competitors right now to 
scale back and offer a cheaper device. Not right now. I think if no. anything, they may just have to wait for Moore's Law to naturally drop the prices on the hardware. I think tablet prices will continue to go down. I've always said I think the concept of a thousand dollar tablet, anything near the anything hovering around that area of, of price that it can that it competes with a laptop. I mean, even five hundred dollar tablet iPad competes with a laptop, sure. at least a PC laptop. I don't think um, an Android tablet does though. Right, right, they, and they've always right. Even the cheapest Android tablets have have often tried to. Often, the only way they've been able to match the iPad on price is with a carrier tied subsidy, and a two year yeah. lock in. So they've not been competitive on price at all. And I think Amazon is showing that in order to compete with with the iPad, to compete with Amazon now too, it's not enough just to have um, a cheap commodity hardware. You also have to sell the entire narrative. It's what do you do with the device, and how does the company who has to who can, the company, the manufacturer, the OEM, can't expect to make a lot of money off of the tablets. There's not a lot of profit. Yeah. So where else are you going to make the money? Uh, Amazon, obviously, they're going to make the money from the one-click buying in the store. They're going to make money from the music store. They're going to make money from uh, the app store. So Amazon has that built in, and they might be one of the only ones that could possibly do this. Exactly. Amazon yeah. and Apple are the only ones I know of that can do that. Yeah, it's 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 interesting. It's getting fascinating. Uh, well, you know who else could possibly do this? Um, Microsoft when they release their Windows right. 8. I think Microsoft's Windows 8 tablets are going to be extremely successful. Yeah, Microsoft is the only other company that has that is farther along on yeah. content deals like that than um, uh, than Google is. And, and the fact that you know you're kind of already in the environment, right? You're you're there already. You could kind of justify. Right. Microsoft spending. has a yeah. Microsoft um, the the one thing. Hopefully the, the uh, if you can say one nice thing about Steve Ballmer, it's been that he 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 recognized and made sure to achieve uh, the benefit of having the same user interface across all the devices. If you have an Xbox, if you have a Windows 8 tablet, if you have Windows Phone 7, the interfaces are consistent and the same or will be within the next year or so. And that is very important because once you have a mode that the user understands and it's a user interface that they're accustomed to, they know where everything is, they probably have a certain amount of app lock-in, mm -hmm. apps they've bought that run in that environment. Um, having that coherent and consistent ecosystem across all classes of devices, all sizes, all types, living room, desktop, and pocket, um, I think that's a very smart move on on, on their part. Yeah, uh, that actually leads to one of the stories that we have is Microsoft is bringing cable programming to the Xbox. Uh, it's about time. I mean, we've, we've discussed this for many years here uh, on the network and on the shows that this is something that needs to happen. Uh, this is a environment that people like. Obviously, uh, the Xbox 360 is the best selling uh, console, uh, I guess, up to date, up to now. Uh, millions of uh, people are using this. And it people are using it for more than just gaming. People are using it for Hulu. They're using it for Netflix. Now, Microsoft, uh, the long rumored uh, plans to bring in cable television is true. They have signed a deal with multiple, multiple partners. Uh, I believe nearly 40 television content providers, including Comcast, Verizon, HBO in the U.S. It'll rolling. It'll start rolling out programming on the Xbox Live, but it's also reached a deal with the U.K., Spain, uh, Canada, Mexico, Germany, and Italy. This is becoming the central hub for media in your living room. This is now th this is when it gets a little tricky. The content that's going to be provided on these devices is not up to what Microsoft wants, but up to the cable provider. Comcast currently with their Xfinity service is stating that they are only going to release on demand programming right now, while Fios is stating that only some channels live programming is going to be available on the Xbox 360. Good move, bad move. What do you think? I think I see where you're going with this. I think uh, I, th I think you're making the point that it seems inconsistent with the strategy we were just talking about, about leveraging a multi-platform user interface and multi-platform stores and movie and TV and media rentals. How does it play into that? How does that fit? How does how does living room cable television subscriptions that you can't download, that you can't move to your phone, move to your laptop, move to your TV, but just on the Xbox, not to your Windows Live account or any of that stuff, uh, how does that help them? And I'm not sure. I, I would suspect they're probably getting a sizable percentage sure. of the subscriber uh, price or some kind of payment from those cable companies by offering their Xbox as a set-top device. Uh, but I'm curious also, Andrew, what, what excites you about having the Xbox as your cable box? Because when I saw this news, I thought, well, don't they give you a cable box anyway? 
Um, yeah. And, and, and wouldn't the interface probably be a little bit easier to use on, on the, uh, you know, the Comcast provided uh, cable box or a TiVo? One thing that Google has done a great job with is the fact that with Google TV, it kind of integrates in your TV. It's not two separate units. It, it bridges that gap. And for many people, and, I, and I've beat up Google TV uh, tons of times. Uh, they send me a... I, 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 every week, I used to almost just destroy them on the air because I thought it was a useless device and because of all the complaints. Google sent yeah. me a Google TV to review. And I told them, I will review this, but I will be honest about it. I still say uh, there were some aspects that I took back and I said, you know, it's not as bad as I thought it was, but it's still not a device that everybody could possibly use. It, it, there's right. still and some complication. As, now, are they, you still have it? Because are they still, still blocking... Are are the, are the, are the your, uh, ABC and Hulu and all those guys? Are they still blocking access to their streaming yeah. TV shows? Yeah, which, which and see is when they absurd. did that, it killed the entire value proposition for the Google TV. It did, and it's totally absurd that they did that. But the problem with Google TV has been is the lack of development. Uh, th- that the device could be is a little underpowered for what it is. But my wife loves it. My wife thinks it's the greatest thing in the world. She finds it so easy to use. And I'm thinking, you are a person that. Just could DVR something. I mean, that's as far as she goes with the technology stuff. She loves this device inside and out. So obviously it's targeting somebody. I think if Microsoft were to do what Google attempted to do with bridging the gap where it's connected to the TV and it piggybacks off of the cable, which I think that's what it's going to potentially do in the long run. I think it'll be a piggyback system where your TV, your cable will all be integrated in this device. Uh, I think there's a lot of potential there because a lot of people don't like the environment that the cable pro- companies provide you there are so, many so people why, that don't why like does that. your why does your wife love the google tv is it because she likes th- their interface to the tv channels that much better than the cable providers she doesn't have to go to imp- box she doesn't have to go to input too it's built in it's built into your cable so what it does it connects to the cable and whatever your cable is on that's the input it's on so the you don't have to go like for the xbox you know you flip the switch and you go to input 2 for the xbox input 3 for the ps3 right right it's, there's no imp, it's not flipping inputs it's connected it piggybacks off your cable provider and you don't have direct tv do you i don't okay no, cuz I, I think files. that's the only one so, so your so your google tv then is not a dvr correct no it's not so, so your wife probably still had. You still probably have to go to the DVR to record anything. Yeah, but she could with the Google, you know, with like the the Google TV uh, controller. Oh, it can program it. Yeah, yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah. Okay. So I could pull up, you know, my guide. I could pull up my DVR. I could change the channel all in Google TV. So I guess what I'm getting at is, would you say that that the only reason that your wife loves the Google TV is because of the user interface is yeah. that much superior to the user interface that the cable provider gives you? Um. I, or is she I, using like apps and Netflix and Amazon streaming? She's like using the other Netflix. Services. Like she likes the fact that she uses Netflix to and w- could watch TV on the same type of device. You know, she doesn't need to flip around. Right, not to like yeah. a Roku or, yeah. or a home theater PC yeah. or one of those things. Uh, yeah, I, I, and I have a Roku, but she never uses the Roku surprisingly, and I like the Roku a little better. Well, you have to switch the input. Yeah, you have to switch <laughs> the input. So there you go. She's not going to use it. Uh, and so it is interesting how that works, uh, but. They are adding some channels. Now, this is the problem, and, and, I, and I, I don't know if I'm the only one that noticed this. There's no official name for this. I read, for, this pre- I read the press release for, what? Uh, for the Xbox, for this, for this environment. There's no name. Oh. There's no type service. So I, I, there are two things that I'm curious about. And Paul brought it up on, on Wednesday. Is there going to be pricing? And what is the pricing going to be? And what is it called? Yeah, I want to know what the price is different, how the price will differ from just getting a regular cable set-top box. If it's in addition, if it's if it costs more to have the Xbox instead of or in addition to a regular cable box or DVR, yeah. forget it. I don't know who's going to do that. But if they can somehow offer a cheaper incentive, maybe to win back folks like me who haven't had cable for a while because I'm a cord cutter, I get everything from the internet and let's, you know, BitTorrent now and then. Um, and, and now, if, if the, and I have an Xbox 360 though, so if they offered cheaper cable to me through Comcast from whom I get my internet but not cable, um, I, that might entice me to try it. But if it costs anything more than regular cable, I see no reason to do that. It, it is interesting how they're combining this device. I, I think a lot of people are going to like it. I think a lot of kids are going to like this. Uh, it's going to be interesting, but are they going to push the media devices more? And what does I this mean? If, what does this mean for the tablet? Now, that's another interesting thing, right? 
Wait, before you go there, yeah. I, I just hit me. I, I wonder if they plan to do some kind of social engagement with TV watching, you know, like they have the exp they already have a way to shoot. What's the, I know there's some feature I've never used it myself, but I've heard people talk about this. Yeah, you can watch with movies with friends, but in the with UK, friends, yeah. in the UK, they do do that with Sky with um, with some of the soccer matches. You could actually sit there with your friends and watch a soccer game and it's like this auditorium. Oh, really? Now, can yeah. you talk over a headset like you can with and Xbox you talk over Live? the headset? Yeah. Really? Oh, that's cool. Yeah. So, yeah, they may see that as the future of social TV watching, which I think Twitter is also trying to capitalize on. A lot of people see that, you know, watching, you know, how do you, uh, there's a big market still in, in connecting mm -hmm. things that we do in isolation at home that if given the choice, we would do in the company of friends. And so therefore yes. would like to connect to our other friends' living rooms. Yeah, so it might be interesting. They're saying that uh, the deal is also, uh, they've already partnered with uh, ESPN and Netflix, which we know, and Hulu. Uh, we're going to start seeing partnerships with Bravo, Sci-Fi, UFC, TMZ, and Today Show. I get the Today Show, I guess. So I don't know how they're going to do this. It's, it's, I'm, I'm imagining it's going to be very select programming. Very oh, select programming. Yeah, we're going to, um, maybe I'm wrong, but I imagine it's going to be like 10 or 15 channels. That's interesting. Yeah, I don't think I we're going to get all the cable channels. I think we're going to get like 10 or 15 channels. They're going to see how it goes, and they're going to add more channels. So you don't think it's going to replace the cable set-top box? No, no, it's not. Interesting. But you know what else is interesting? I remember— um, they'd have to, oh, Sorry, they'd have to do it for free then. If, if it was, a, if it was yeah. only a limited set of uh, channels or features, I think they'd have to do it free and maybe even offer it to people who have no cable subscription at all, if that's really the road they're going. Yeah, they're saying uh, we're going to see it in, in, in the fall rollout, which is in a couple of weeks now. So we'll see what happens in a couple of weeks. Yeah. Uh, which is, it's very interesting that these these gaps are being bridged amongst all of them. Uh, Microsoft reportedly uh, trying to bid for Yahoo once again. This is another news that's coming up. Um, yeah, I suspect that's not going anywhere. I don't think so. I don't think so. You know, Yahoo really dropped the ball with that original acquisition deal uh yeah. just and now to... the company's worth half as much as, as when that all, whole thing started so, but actually just one last thing about microsoft yeah. um and this kind of goes into yahoo and where microsoft is going uh -huh. microsoft is trying to diversify get away from the desktop pc software market which they've has been their their uh, crutch and their cash cow uh for, since really the start of the company and they're trying to branch away from that they've gone into advertising microsoft has a very big advertising network similar to uh google's adsense not the same size but with the same ambitions and scope uh, and scalability uh, desire. Mm -hmm. They're also trying to be a media company so for going back to the days of MSN. They've always wanted to be like an AOL. They want to be a contact aggregator. They want to be very happy and cozy and in great relationships with folks like ESPN and Disney and the parent company, you know, parent company Disney and uh, News Corp. And they, they, Microsoft plays well at the corporate, corporate level. And media is a very corporate consolidated level. I think Microsoft knows that. They can play that game well. And I think that they know that because of the Microsoft brand name and clout and uh, diversity of platforms that Microsoft products mm -hmm. are on and can access, phone, Xbox, living room, desktop, et cetera, I think they, they think that they can position themselves to be the ones to coax and cozy the traditional cable and broadcast huh. TV companies into coming into the internet delivery age and partnering with, partnering with Microsoft to deliver some products and experiences that you can't get on non-Microsoft products. I think that's, yeah. that might be what they're going for with this. Long yeah, that, that's actually very interesting. And they do have the advantage that, that nobody else really does. I yeah. mean, even Sony doesn't have that. Yeah, exactly. And Sony, again, is one of those companies who's trying to make a tablet, and yet they don't have an end, they, they don't have an end experience to sell the user. It's not enough to sell the tablet hardware. You've got to sell what you do with it at the, once, you, once you get it. Yeah. Very interesting, though. I'm just curious to see where this goes in about a year, you know, how this is going to play and how this is going to play with the tablet. Because uh, if they could reach these, these deals, these exclusive deals with uh, the cable companies, it may be a huge selling point for these Microsoft tablets. Oh, yeah. I mean, we're, we're, we're in a period of massive turmoil. Yeah. Uh, with, it's the uh, Wild West. Media. It's the Wild West. Yeah. And in a couple of years, like you said, everything's going to change. And a couple of years from now, you know, it, think about it. In a couple of, five, ten years from now, 
major companies may not exist. Microsoft or Facebook or someone may, may fade into obscurity if something goes wrong, or they could make a giant comeback if Microsoft is successful with Windows 8 and with these cable deals and the things we've been talking about for the last few minutes. Um, you, and maybe Apple, who's on the top of the world right now, may sink with their lack of leadership. We don't know. A lot could happen in the next couple of years. A uh, couple quick Quick stories before we wrap it up. iTunes match hits the U.S. in end of October for twenty four ninety nine. For twenty four ninety nine, you could uh, potentially take all your MP3s, everything you have, everything you've ripped from a CD, everything you've even uh, potentially pirated over the years, and uh, iTunes will match it with a DRM free two hundred fifty six kilobit AAC version of it, uh, therefore legitimizing some of your files and getting you in into the iTunes store. It's going to be twenty four ninety nine for a year. Um, very interesting and very, very much worth doing if you want to uh, kind of convert your files. Even if your file is, if it's a very low end quality, uh, as as long as they, they have it in the iTunes store, they will match it for you, which is great. It's very interesting. My, my take on this is that I think I might get it. Um, a lot of speculation has been going on since they first announced this at WWDC back in June. Uh People say it indemnifies you against piracy. You know, it legitimizes your pirated MP3s, your, your Napster downloads from 10 years ago. Mm -hmm. But what we don't know is whether that's just for your iOS devices or also for your desktop Mac or PC. They've never said, I suspect huh. that, people, that I, what? I didn't, I, didn't, I didn't think of it that way. I thought it was, it was open to the desktop as long as you have iTunes. Right. And they see that, and they, they haven't said it, but I think if you think about it, they probably would not do that because on iOS, the songs and the media come and go, right? It's a pin, it's a local caching kind mm -hmm. of service. Yeah. They're always there, and you cache them as you need them, and you delete them as you need them. You can't do that on your, on your PC because you've got to store that music somewhere, yeah. and it's got to be on your PC or Mac hard drive. So what do you do when you download cloud iTunes matched files from Apple? Do you delete your old files? Do you Where do they go? Yeah, you know, where do you, does it go? You, do you do you double the size of your of your library on your on your iTunes? And do you need uh, to do you need to pay them twenty five bucks a year every year? Right. That's right. also the other thing because in the story it says it's twenty four ninety nine a year. Now, how about next year when I've made my files legit? What's going to happen if I don't pay them this twenty five dollars? Uh, exactly. That's that's the other reason they think that they will not replace the ones on your local. Uh, okay. uh, Mac or PC, because if you do stop paying, and this has been speculated, people said, well, so, okay, so you give them 25 bucks once, you get their high quality copies, you never pay them again, yeah, right? Yeah. Uh, end of story. Well, I think that's why they're not going to do this. With iOS, they can push and keep encrypted everything on there, just like Spotify does. They have a, you know, a special way of doing that and not having to store your entire iTunes library or replace your entire iTunes library, whereas on the desktop, they're not going to delete my lossless stuff. They better not, at least. That they better not delete all my lossless well, rips. Uh, and, and, but if they replace my 128 kilobit Napster downloads, hey, that'd be great. But I don't think they're going to do that. A iTunes ruined my, my uh, years and years of organizing my MP3 collection. When I first got the Mac, I, I didn't know that it did this auto-adjust uh, stuff, auto-archive stuff. And the files that I had, you know, by category and by in, in folders and different folders, it just took everything and it just did the uh, iTunes organization, yeah. which means put them in files and files and files and files, and I can't ever fix this problem again. There's no uh, way of reversing it. Right. So it kind of forces you to have iTunes handle your, I guess, your, your MP3 search. Yeah, for me, I, I've let it. I've happily let it handle everything organize, organization for me since since iTunes version one. So that's not a problem for me. But I, I get what you're saying. And the problem was a lot of my stuff was not IDE tagged. It was a lot of older oh. stuff from years ago. So uh, I, I've spent some time trying to fix it, but it was a, it was a big problem. So you don't. Who knows? Maybe they are going to say you know, but you have to delete the old version. By the way, here's here's a gripe of mine about iTunes Match. Yeah. Why two fifty six kilobit AAC? Why not three twenty? No, why not 48 kilobit AAC plus plus, which the newest iPhone since version since iPhone 4 and iPad 1 could yeah. can totally play. And I've tried it. I gave some my uh, uh, my mom recently got an iPhone for the first time, first smartphone, and she wants a bunch of music. So I gave her like whatever oldies and Beatles stuff I had, you know, and I converted it all because I told her I get I said, get the small iPhone. And I'll just give you like a bunch of this music. And I, I just re-rip all my lossless stuff to the littlest, tiniest files. But I can't tell the difference. And I, I and I did it to, for her because she's the only one I know that has now the uh, the iPhone that can that can play that. Uh, but for everyone else, you have to stick with AAC, uh, original AAC. But the newest phones, iPhones, iOS devices can play this 
what's called AAC+, Plus, which is literally half the file size, twice the efficiency of existing AAC. It's what it's to AAC what AAC was to MP3 10 years ago. Okay, so how backwards compatible is AAC++ to MP3 and does uh, does every audio It's not editing, at all. It's, it's not, not all backwards compatible. But AAC but the, is. No, no there's no uh, format wise there's no backwards compatibility with the format. There's backwards compatibility with uh, with devices. With devices. Me, yeah. Right. Uh, so you have to have either an iPhone 4 or above or an iPad 1 or above to play AAC+. Plus. But once you have it then, and this is why I don't get why Apple wouldn't do this for those customers, yeah. they can be streaming at less than half the file size for transparent audio quality. I don't know why a cloud provider would not want to cut their bandwidth in half. Yeah, why not? That, that's very interesting. I thought it was AAC+. Plus. Right. Wait, Wait what? I, what I, thought, I thought it was AAC+. Plus. That they're offering on iTunes Mac? Yeah, maybe I'm wrong. Initially, I thought it was AAC+, no, Plus, and I actually said, oh, it's going to be small files. Right. No, it's not. Because there's... Oh, you may be thinking that it's iTunes Plus. That's the name maybe, they give maybe to that's iTunes what Plus. I did. Yeah, maybe that's I, what iTunes, I did. iTunes Plus is, does not use AAC+. Plus. Uh, this is... <laughs> it's very simple. Cool. I know. <laughs> uh, and all the other... All the, all the players should be able to play AAC++, Plus Plus too. Uh, I'm looking. Well, at, Apple's can. What do you mean? Yeah. Like Winamp could play it. Uh, some other softwares. Yes. I mean, some phone. Most phones could. Even. Uh, I'm just going down a list. Uh, VLC plays it. So it wasn't even that. It, it's you know very specific to yeah, Apple and it's, products. And it's and it's been on the market now since about 2003. So it's and Flash it's, supports it too. Yeah. As far as yeah. decoding. So goes. I don't I don't know why. So it's higher quality for less than half the file size. I don't know why Apple is choosing to use uh, higher bit rate uh, standard AAC instead. Beats me. Yeah. Uh, and Flash released uh, version 11 of the... You said something very interesting on your show. Actually, that, that's why I had this in the notes. Uh, you were commenting on Flash, uh, Flash and you were commenting on Adobe Air. And right. you made a very interesting uh, story, a fact about how Adobe Air was supposed to be the future. Yeah. That and kind of changed, didn't it? It kind of fell on its face. <laughs> Uh, yeah, yeah. I think because Steve Jobs effectively killed Flash that uh, Adobe really had to rethink their strategy with Flash and with Adobe Air. Here they were trying to create a whole new uh, write once, run anywhere runtime, but Apple wasn't going to support it on the most on the world's most popular mobile devices. And uh, Microsoft now has said that they want their Windows 8 uh, Metro style browser mm -hmm. version of Internet Explorer will not support plugins. That includes Flash and surprisingly even Silverlight, we think. So... Uh, it it kind of leaves the and now Microsoft has has kind of abandoned their plans for Silverlight to be an Adobe Air competitor, to be a Java competitor, a, a, a runtime competitor, and instead they're going with they're firmly in the HTML5 camp, as is Apple now. Ironically, the company who all along should have been in the HTML5 camp and used to be because they have no competitor to Air or or Flash or Silverlight is Google, and they're the only company now sticking with Flash because they feel it gives them the competitive advantage over Apple products. Even though it's a proprietary, yeah. a proprietary and slower standard, which Google, by by their philosophical nature, should have always been opposed to. So it's it's kind of ironic. Well, well, with with Android, when you go to a, when you go to like YouTube, it's Flash. Right, on Android, which, and it's a bad experience. Which it shouldn't it's be. Slow. It shouldn't be. Right. Fla F Flash on the Android is is such. I you know I've uninstalled it. it it's so yeah. it's so bad. The experience is so bad. I don't want it on there. Takes up way too much space. It's about twenty megs, and, and probably lower now. It's probably like fifteen now. But I took it off. I'm I don't I don't need it because I'm not accessing anything, and it's awful. Uh, but uh, Flash Eleven, uh, the biggest feature is that it does hardware acceleration uh, graphics. Uh, it's supposed to be uh, many many improvements over Flash Ten. This new rendering speed allows console quality games on the Flash platform, according to Adobe, who published two sample videos demonstrating the capabilities of the new Flash. Uh, another important feature is that Flash 11 is native 64-bit support. Uh, has native 64-bit support. So I guess this is the next stage in Flash. But Adobe Air, uh, I really thought it was going to be big. I thought a lot of people were going to develop in this. I thought a lot of applications were going to be Adobe Air apps, but it did not work. Yeah, because what, what we saw instead, right, is that we saw a faster move to mobile than I think Adobe expected and the lack of support from the device manufacturers, because in order to have 
fast, efficient software and a good, fast, snappy user experience with smooth, slick animations and a very fast, responsive UI, you have to have natively running apps. I think uh, Apple knew that. That's why they pushed the app platform so hard is they felt that they, that could bring a new level of performance, responsiveness and uh, and uh, graphic styling to the web at large. If you appify the web, they felt that created a better user experience as well as providing a nice little device lock in while they're at it. Uh, and, and meanwhile, Adobe, I think they just saw they can't compete. Um, HTML5 is too capable and too popular and too open source and too beloved by uh, web developers and the open source community and, um, and by Microsoft and Apple and Google. And so where does that leave Air? Who wants to use Air when it's not as optimized for mobile devices, yeah. probably sucks battery harder and doesn't uh, uh, give you that kind of experience? Yeah, so uh, interesting, though. This is out finally. I got to install it. I haven't installed it yet, so I haven't had a chance to play around with it. But uh, that about wraps it up for today. 604. Look, an hour. Exactly an hour we did. Uh, Eric, I really appreciate you coming on. Check out Eric's show on the Twit Network Mondays, Wednesdays, and Fridays. Uh, you're on 11 p.m. Pacific. Uh, 8 p.m. Pacific, 11 p.m. East. Uh, right. It's, it's a little right. late here, but it, it's worth the watch because it, a lot of great calls and a lot of people have really interesting questions, actually. They do. It's a great yeah. show, and thanks for, for saying that. I, I should warn everybody, though, I may not do a show tonight because I think everyone's still buzzing about Steve Jobs, and we did a five-hour marathon of that Wednesday, so I'm not yeah. sure I'm going to do that again tonight. But if you follow me on Twitter, uh, I'll let you know. E-R-I-K-L-A-N-I-G-A-N. And, and that's it for uh, this week. Uh, we'll see you all next week on what uh, Tech News Weekly. I'm changing my shows. I don't know. I'm mixing it all up. Good night, everybody. <laughs>